We're going to be back in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians today, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. We'll be looking at uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, as you're finding that in your Bible. Um, this is a part of the series, the second, part, the second sermon in the series, Becoming a Mature Church. And the challenge here is that we would mature in Christ. The challenge is that uh, even those that are saved, those that are saved and sanctified, need to grow into the fullness of who Jesus is and what Jesus desires to do in our lives. So the question then is, what does a mature church look like? And Corinth, the church in Corinth, gives us plenty of illustrations of what an immature church looks like and what's going on there. Uh, but practically, we would say not only what does maturity look like, but what does sanctification look like in practice, in reality. So, so let's jump into the Word this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. The Bible says this, would you stand with me as we read God's Word? The Bible says this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, he's, he's wanting to make a petition to the people. In other words, he's strongly stating, I need to speak to you about something. I appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas, but that I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask for you to send your spirit to work among us as we uh, read your word and we uh, sit and listen to the preaching of your word. We pray today, God, that your Holy Spirit would make this word a living word and one that would shape us, God. We pray, Lord, that sin would decrease, that, that we, are, the flesh, uh, as individuals, Lord, we would decrease, but that you would increase and you would be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You could be seated. Uh, again, I've, I've mentioned before, in fact, the, the first sermon uh, just last week, I kind of gave a little bit of context for what's going on in Corinth, and that was important uh, for us to understand uh, in Corinth. Corinth was a diverse group. Uh, that included Romans and Greeks and Jews and now Christians as well. And uh, when Rome defeated that Confederate Greek city-state on all their armies, they rebuilt Corinth as kind of the hub of, um, of their presence there in the Greek peninsula. So because of that, there was the religious, more pagan influence that was there uh, and, and the economic influence and it being a modern city of its time. And, uh, but like any place, diversity is a beautiful thing uh, when, it's, when it, we're talking about holy diversity or things that God's created and done, not s sin and paganism and stuff like that, but uh, the different kinds of people that were there from the different backgrounds and different economic levels. All those things are good. And, uh, but with diversity, diversity always has a price. And the price that it has is that often the enemy wants to highlight the things that are different about us. All right, And he wants to bring that to the attention. And so, in fact, throughout the book of Corinthians, Paul writes this letter and he deals over and over and over again with these kinds of issues. In chapter 3, he deals with division. In chapter 6, there's, he says, you know, there's actually lawsuits. You in the church are suing one another in the church. Uh, uh, in chapter 7, there's, there's division, if you will, in their marriages. Uh, marriages are having issues. In chapter 9, Paul even says, you know, look, I just, I'm surrendering all my 
my rights. I, I understand now that that uh, what you think about me, my authority, what I, my God-given rights uh, are uh, are being contested by you. I'm just going to give them up because I don't want to fight. I don't want to create more disunity. In chapter 11, he talks about uh, a disunity or, a, if you will, and a confusion that's taking place surrounding the Lord's Supper. All right, and uh, in chapter 12, he talks about being one body and many members, and so he uses this illustration we'll get to eventually about the body and the different functions of our body parts, but how our body, the different parts, work together as a whole. Uh, in chapter 13, he talks about love. Uh, love, he would say, is the, is the answer to the problems that's going on, many of the problems going on in the life of the Corinthian church. Chapter 14, he talks about orderly worship. That there ought to be a unity, not a uniformity, but a unity in the life of the church when we worship together. And there is an order, all right? There is an order, and that'll look like different things. And uh, we'll get to that at some point. Chapter 14 talks a lot about that because sometimes what we might feel like is disorder is part of the order of the Holy Spirit. Um, and sometimes what we think is orderly is actually disorder when it comes to the things of the Spirit. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. But the idea here is that I want to highlight it in some of these chapters uh, of this letter that Paul writes to the church of Corinth, that there's problems of the in the church at Corinth, and they, they come and they manifest themselves in a number of different ways. But I want to focus this morning on... The scripture that we're looking at, all right, chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, uh, specifically address, and he, he starts out by saying, I want to appeal to you. He's kind of started the, his letter with, this is who you are, this is what, what is expected of you, this is the way things ought to be, and then he, now he's gotten to, now let me appeal to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so he's bringing Christ into this. This is not just someone using Jesus to get their way, but he's saying, hey, I want you to understand there's a problem here. So let me give you kind of three things from these verses that we were focusing on in chapter 1 today. Uh, number one, division is a problem. Division is a problem. And he says, is, is Christ divided? Uh, you know, he, he, this is a rhetorical question, obviously. Uh, and he's talking about there's going on in the church, there's factions of people. All right. Now, this isn't, this isn't a church where there are different relational groups of people or there are different family groups in the church that make up this church. And he's saying that creates division. That's not division in and of itself. Some people have said even before, well, I don't like, um, um, uh, these different groups, these, these different cliques in the church, all right? Now, if a clique is, is exclusive, in other words, if it's not welcoming to someone seeking, it's not welcoming to the other brothers and sisters, then that's a problem. That's creating division. But relational groups within the church, the, in other words, people who have an affinity for one another, who have developed friendships over time, is not a division that's going on. This is different. This division is a problem. And the problem with division is that it, it attacks the foundation of the church that in Christ we are gathered to him all right and as we're gathered to Christ we come be we become closer to one another despite our differences despite our different opinions despite our different backgrounds despite our different jobs that we have or the size of our family or those kinds of things we're drawn together in Jesus Christ and Christ is the focus now catch this, whenever there's division in the life of the church, most often it's because there are people who have taken their eyes off of Jesus. They've taken their eyes off of a focus on Christ and they're getting off on something else. All right? Uh, they lose track of the mission of God. They lose track of the character of God. Uh, the right uh, theology and doctrine is negated. Uh, that is, biblical doctrine is negated uh, for other things. Those are the things that create division. And so it attacks the foundation because the foundation of the church, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. And when we are focused upon Him, we are drawn together. When we're focused on other issues, we are pulled apart. Always. That's just, that's just reality. In fact, here, uh, let me read. Uh, Paul writes to Titus in chapter 3, verse 9. Uh, he says this, avoid, avoid foolish controversies. Avoid genealogies and dissensions and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Verse 10, as for a person who stirs up division, 
after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, and he is self-condemned. You hear what the problem is? He's like, don't get all caught up on all these, all these foolish controversies, genealogies. Now, for Jews, you've got to understand, for Jews, they're big on their genealogy. What's your heritage? Where you come from? And all that kind of And they want to argue about who's got the most pure genealogy or who's got the best one, who's the best background. He's, and he's, get, get off of all these small dissensions, even quarreling about the law. And that could go either way because there's some people who want to get all into the nitty-gritty. Okay, it's okay to talk about, but they want to quarrel with about the nitty-gritty of the law. All right, And then other people who are wanting to negate the law. They just want to say, eh, it doesn't matter how you live. Morality, that's, that's uh, old-fashioned, that's legalistic, whatever the case may be. And he said, these things are unprofitable and they're worthless and they really are a problem. And he says, and the person who is stirring up the division, division, they are divisive in this way. That person needs to be warned once. And then after they're warned the second time, after that, they need to be put out. They need to be dealt with in such a way because that person is warped and sinful, he says. In verse 11 of, the, of our scripture in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he says, It's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. There's quarreling among you. There's grudges. There's ongoing things that are going on in the life of the church. This should not be. This should not be. Most church splits... And most churches that deal with division are over it. The division and the split is over irrelevant opinions. And a lot of times division comes over irrelevant opinions and, pre and preferences and all this side stuff. Somebody getting petty over something. And it's over that that they divide. And all the while, a lot of churches that are all so divisive and arguing and infighting, they're, they're negating biblical truth. They're allowing false teaching. They're allowing sin to run rampant. And while they uh, fight over the color of the wall, or they fight over something menial and insignificant. Lord, help us. Stand on truth. Stand up for the truth. Don't stand up just for your opinions and preferences do you understand the difference a lot of people don't a lot of people have a hard time with it because what we do is we fight for our opinions and we will quickly compromise truth lord help us second thing i want to note is what division looks like i want to kind of give you just a, an idea of of what division looks like Part of, sometimes just in practically in families or in relational groups, not just even in the church, but certainly in the church as well, part of what division looks like is trying to change everybody else. Trying to force them to do what you want them to do. Uh, in marriages, that's a big problem when you have one spouse trying to, trying to initiate change in the, in the life of the other person. All right. Uh, sometimes that they think is they're an agent of the Holy Spirit when actually they're just an agent of their own desires to see their spouse change certain things all right now sin absolutely you ought to encourage your spouse to quit sinning all right i'm not saying that what i'm talking about is nitpicking and trying to to control other people all right controlling personalities controlling um, uh, attitudes fixing everybody around you is not helpful it's harmful not only that uh, another kind of component of a division is following man before Christ. In other words, uh, he even dealt with it here. He says, you know, I, in verse 12, what I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Well, that's what we ought to all be doing. But see, what that happens is they find their favorite pastor, and that's the only one that they're going to listen to. That Nobody can do, uh, hold a candle to their favorite pastor. And so I'm, I follow Cephas, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. I want to hear Paul preach. I'm not going to come to church if Cephas is preaching, and blah, 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 blah. And there's this division because what happens is they're following man rather than Jesus Christ. If all you've got is preacher religion... You don't have anything. If all you've got is following after a person, you'll, you'll not get very far. 
This can also play out in a, in a kind of a denominationalism where we actually will, will de-Christianize other people of other denominations just simply because of where they go to church. Now let me just say quickly, there are some denominations that are apostate now. They compromise truth. I understand that, all right? So we need to stand for that. But what we don't need to do and what we need to be careful of sometimes is while we might disagree with some minimal or minor doctrinal issues... Let's not let that get in the way of all of us making it to heaven. Let's not allow those things to become divisive for us. Herman Edwards, the coach with the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, they recently changed their name, but uh, back at this time said, the players that play on this football team will play for the name on the side of the helmet and not the name on the back of the jersey. Let me just ask you a question. Are you doing what you're doing for the kingdom? Are you doing it because of the pastor? Are you doing it because you like a leader? Are you doing it because of the name on the church sign? Are you doing it because of some affinity for that organization? Or are you doing what you're doing because you have a love for Jesus Christ? Because if you're doing it for another reason, what can happen is the enemy will have an inroad into your heart, an inroad into your life, to create division because of where your heart is. Being much concerned about the rise of denominations in the church, John Wesley tells of a dream that he had, and uh, John Wesley is actually the founder of Methodism, although he never pulled out of the, uh, the Anglican church that he was a part of. He tells this dream, and in the dream he was ushered into to the gates of hell. And when he got there, he said, Are there any Presbyterians here? Yes, came the answer. He asked, are there any Baptists, any Episcopalians, any Methodists? The answer was yes, each time. He, he became distressed. Wesley was then ushered into, into the gates of heaven. And when he got into heaven, he asked the same question. And the answer was no, every time. No, no, no. To this, Wesley asked, well, then who is inside? And the answer came back, there are only Christians here. There are only Christians Sometimes in the church, uh, when there's a disagreement or there's a difference of opinion, there will begin to be a gang, I'll just call it, and uh, uh, despairingly so, um, uh, a gang mentality. And what that is, is we know that there's a disagreement. Maybe it's been on the church board. It's among leaders or among people uh, doing ministry in the church or, or uh, just uh, relational components that were even outside of the church. And I've even heard people in the church say, well, you don't worry about it. I'm on your side. Now, sometimes they may, be, uh, they may have an affinity to do things the right way. They want to be in the right mindset, the right attitude, and the right side of things biblically. But listen, be careful when you're starting to pledge your allegiance to a cause or a person other than Jesus Christ. Be careful. Be careful. Another way we create division, this one isn't often talked about, but it's, it's true nonetheless, is when we try to make every opinion valid. All right. Well, we try to we try to operate with this idea that everybody everybody's opinion is equal. All right. Now the problem with an opinion is an opinion is only as good as it is true. All right. Now some opinions have to do with with subjective things anyway. So your favorite song that we sing for worship that's subjective. All right, you can't build your whole theology on your favorite song. If you do, you'll be in trouble. All right, but, but there are some things that are either true or they aren't. So if someone says something that contradicts the, the, the Scripture, like let's say that they would say something like, well, when Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't sufficient to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that's your opinion, but that's wrong. And it can't be validated in any way in the life of the church, okay? So what that means is when there are people who have opinions that are wrong, we have to lovingly, now not brutally, not, not uh, uh, with a club or something, uh, beat them down, but we have to understand that not everybody has a good idea, not everybody has the best perspective, and people are often wrong. All of us can be wrong about things sometimes. Uh, there was a... A story of a family that from uh, uh, the state of New York, and uh, or the city of New York, I'm sorry, and they bought a ranch out west. And, and uh, when their friends uh, came to visit them, uh, they inquired about the ranch's name. They said, what, well, uh, what, what did you name your ranch? You know, you came out and bought this property and started a ranch. And the rancher replied, well, I wanted to name it the Bar J. But my wife favored Susie Q., 
One of our sons wanted the flying W and the other liked the lazy Y. So we're calling it the Bar J, Susie Q, flying W, lazy Y ranch. Well, the friend asked, okay, oh, by the way, where are all your cattle? And he said, well, none survived the branding. They didn't survive the branding. There's a time when not every opinion can rule and not every opinion is valid. And actually trying to validate every opinion brings diversity or brings division, not diversity. Um, another problem is uh, when people are sensitive about everything. Uh, I know, listen, we live in an hour which people are waiting and looking for something to be outraged about. Don't be that person. Do you hear what I'm saying? With social media and even the, the news media out there, what are we looking for? We're looking for a reason to be offended. We're looking for a reason to be upset about something, to be enraged about something. Well, wait till I get home and I type it into social media. Wait till I tweet this or put this on Facebook and all those kinds of things. And that's a surefire way to live in division. To live in division is to be sensitive about everything. All the time, uh, this sensitivity that we have about everything. And then I, I, one real good way to, to, to create division is just to leave the church. All right, now, let me just say this. There's a time to leave a church, okay? There is a time to leave a church. But there are some people who don't discern they just get upset they just there's something they don't like and they just bail they just leave i left because i was mad i left because i was not being fed i left because i didn't get along with people i left because i didn't agree with the preacher i left because i didn't like where the church was headed i left because all these kinds of things and the problem is they float around and they are never a part of the church in any kind of viable way to encourage or to strengthen the church uh, they've really created division everywhere they've been because they go, they start to, to, to connect into the life of the church, and then they rip themselves out of it and create division. Majoring on the minors is a way that uh, di division is, is seen when we, when we allow the little stuff to make the biggest divides in us. Insisting on our own way creates division. All these kinds of things. And insisting on your own way is a violation of the law of love. All these kinds of things create division. So let me talk about, here's the third observation. What is real unity? What is real unity? Well, real unity is the mind of Christ. Now notice he says in verse 10 that all of you, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now listen, so what some people do when they read that, and they say, well, he's, he's, he's wanting them that there be no divisions among you, that, that, that all of you agree. And so what some people think that means is that that means on every nuance of every little thing that the church agrees. That's not unity, that's conformity, but that's not unity, okay? So there are things we can disagree on, and it's okay. It doesn't have to get in the way. If you like a certain color or a certain decor des uh, design or we didn't sing your favorite song, all those kind of things, those things don't have to lead to division, and they don't mean that we are divided just because we disagree on those kinds of things, all right? Because we don't allow them to go in anywhere but what they are simple disagreement what he's talking about here is that you agree he says i'm appealing to you by the uh, brothers by the name of our lord jesus christ in other words there's this idea that when it comes to christ there is an agreement about what we're doing we want jesus christ to be glorified he's preeminent he's the focus he's everything that we do we 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 need and uh, and we do agree ultimately we agree on consensus so let's say we disagreed about the color of the wall or we disagreed about doing a particular ministry to a particular age group and the church decided we were going to do this together we came to that place then whether that was my will or it wasn't my will I would move with that consensus all right because for me unity is important it may mean that it doesn't mean that I have to agree to it I might not ever fully agree to that and there may be an opportunity somewhere along the way that that, that comes back up and we do a, a, we go a different way but the same mind that he's talking 
talking about is the mind of Christ. All right, that, that mind of Christ, the judgment that he's talking about is, is that being judged by truth or God's word, that these things are priority for us. All right, so when Christ is preeminent, when Christ is the focus, we are moving toward holiness and away from sin. All right. Now, a lot of churches, listen to what I'm going to say, a lot of churches are divided because they've got some people who want to move toward worldliness. All right. They don't want to go all out in sin, and so they want to, but they want to get close to it, and they keep wanting to give moral space and in the gray area and keep allowing things that are questionable. They may not be sinful, but they're questionable, and keep, keep making lots of moral space there, and they'll come into uh, uh, um, a disagreement. They'll come into, there'll be some tension with those who are wanting to. To move toward holiness. And what he's saying right here is our mind should be that of Jesus Christ. We should have the mind of Christ. Our unity is focused on Jesus Christ. It's also focused on the mission of Christ. We have received a great commission. I want you to know something. The purpose of the church is not to make sure God's people are comfortable in the sanctuary. The purpose of the church is not to just please you and keep you happy. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're now on the mission team, you're now on on uh, on the the uh, the wor- one of the workers of the harvest, and we've got a mission, and we are mission focused. And when we get away from the mission, we get into division. So our unity is in Christ. We do not unify around false teachings. We don't unify around these peripheral issues. We don't. Um, we don't live in some way with agreement of sin. A lot of people think this unity is, uh, well, we've got, if we're going to stay unified, we don't want anybody to be upset who's living in sin, so we're just going to let them live in the sin, and we're not going to deal with it. That's not unity. That's compromise, and there's a difference. Our unity is found in Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. A.W. Tozer uh, gave a good illustration Um, that I want to share with you, and I want to kind of close out with this. He said this, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos, all tuned to the same fork, are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So, 100 worshipers meeting together, each one looking uh, to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they to become uni- uh, there to become unified, uh, conscious, and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. In other words, if our focus is on Christ, He brings unity among His people when our focus is on anything else, anything else, we lose. We lose. I have. Uh, we live in divided times, and uh, in these times, I'll, I'll just say one of the most controversial things for the end. Uh, we live in a moment when there are so much going on around us. Can I just tell you why you won't hear me say Black Lives Matter? Let me just say this: as Christians, we cannot tolerate. Racism. We can't tolerate anything that would objectify or alienate or uh, be, uh, breed animosity toward another human being, especially for, for reasons of their gender or their, the color of their skin or their, or their last name or, or what, how much money they have, all those kinds of things. The reason that I don't say Black Lives Matter is not because I'm pro-racism. I'm a Christian. I've got to stand against racism. All right? The reason I do it is because when you read what they stand for, every other thing besides racism is contrary to biblical values. They're against the family. They're against all these other things. So I can't say that. Listen, it's the same reason I don't fly the Confederate flag. Say, oh, I can't. It's about Southern heritage. Well, you know, I'm, I'm from the South, and I've got my Southern accent. But the reason I don't fly the Confederate flag is because it has come to represent something that I don't have to stand for. All right? I don't have to stand for that. And uh, whatever it may be the, quote, appropriate perspective on that stars and stripes, the reality is, as a Christian, I'm not going to allow uh, the flight of a flag to inhibit me from being able to minister to people who need to hear about Jesus Christ. So I'm just not going to allow anything 
to inhibit that kind of stuff. That makes some people upset that I won't say black lives matter. It makes some people upset that I'm not in favor of flying a Confederate flag, all those kinds of things. And, and the reason for it is, is because those things do not embody who I am. And as Christians, we should not allow those things to divide the body of Christ. There's something more important than your skin color, and there's something more important than your heritage. And it is where you stand with Jesus Christ. It's where you stand with Jesus Christ. I don't know who you follow, but I follow Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me today?